we've been finding out on a daily basis almost uh, revelations about the NSA's involvement in subverting the underlying encryption algorithms that uh, make the foundation of security for the internet. So this is news. Uh, Obviously, the NSA breaking ciphers is nothing new, but actually subverting and introducing weaknesses to existing ciphers in order to make them easier to break, that is news. This is not someone making sure they can break into your house. This is someone forcing all of the lock factories in the world to make substandard locks so they can break into everybody's house. This is a rather serious problem problem. But does it affect Bitcoin? So that's the question I set out to answer last week and did quite a bit of research to find out whether the underlying encryption schemes in Bitcoin were affected and what other experts had to say. So first of all, guys, are you worried at all about this? Is this a concern for you? It just seems like it keeps getting worse and worse. Like, what could you imagine about the NSA being able to spy on people? Okay, if you can dream it up, they're probably doing that. (laughs) So I can't really say I'm surprised. Concerned? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Well, this has been one of the exigent scenarios, right? I mean, like the whole idea behind why Litecoin might potentially succeed is that what happens if the encryption algorithm, the hashing algorithm that we use to secure Bitcoin, what happens if that is compromised? What does that allow you to do, Andreas? Are we talking about double spending? Are we talking about just like your bitcoins can be taken from you? I don't think that's the case. So first of all, let's talk about the two different algorithms that are most affected here. Uh, for, first is you talked about the hashing algorithm. So that's uh, SHA-256, the uh, secure hashing algorithm 256. That algorithm produces a 256-bit digital signature or hash that summarizes the input in a cryptographically secure manner. And that's used throughout Bitcoin. It's used as the proof of work. It's used to produce the public addresses. It's used in a number of different places. The other algorithm that's used is elliptic curve cryptography, specifically asymmetric public key encryption using elliptic curves. And that is used in order to generate the relationship between the private key and public key. That's essentially the underlying security that keeps your money locked in the blockchain. Okay, so we're going to definitely have to have to stop there and go back through that a little bit. So what a hash algorithm does is it takes any document, binary file, anything you want, and it provides a signature. And this is a digital signature. It's it's basically a digital hash. It's a fingerprint, if you like, a binary fingerprint of that of that file. So in proof of work, what you're doing in Bitcoin is you're trying to find the specific fingerprint that has characteristics less than a target difficulty. And if you find that, then you can create a new block if you have the proof of work. So theoretically, if uh, SHA-256 was broken, that would allow the NSA very easily to pull out a 51% attack. Essentially, you wouldn't need hashing power to find the block. You'd be able to just basically find the block instantly without going through millions and millions of hashes. You'd just be able to reverse engineer it. So this is because you can basically cheat, right? So you you could basically cut through all the work and you just get the proof, but you didn't actually do the work. Right. So if there is some kind of vulnerability that the NSA could exploit, like maybe they have a leg up because they know exactly what that is because they forced uh, that to be there, but couldn't a, a private criminal take advantage of that too? If there was such a vulnerability? Bingo. And that's the main concern here, because when you force all the lock manufacturers of the world to make weaker locks so you can break in, that means that anybody else who figures out that the locks are weaker can also break in. So that's the real risk here, that if a weakness has been introduced into these algorithms, it's not so much that the NSA can exploit it, because quite honestly, they have a pretty broad toolkit they can exploit to damage Bitcoin, but rather that other actors now have have an opportunity to exploit a certain weakness. Now, for the record, I don't think SHA-256 is broken, and that's not one of my concerns. I think it's more interesting to look at the other algorithm, though. Okay, so so the other algorithm is the elliptical curve, right? Correct. Elliptic curves are a way for doing public key cryptography. So the reason you have a private and public key as part of your Bitcoin uh, as part of your Bitcoin wallet, really. And the keys that control your wallet itself, uh, those are based on elliptic curve cryptography. 
Can, can you explain to me what elliptic curve is actually referring to? I'm trying to understand how this fits. I'll try and do the 15 second explanation as best as I can. So an elliptic curve is basically a geometric shape, a curve that's expressed by a function. In, in the case of Bitcoin, that function is y squared equals x to the cube plus seven. And that particular function, a simple mathematical function, is used because you can express a specific mathematical problem, discrete logarithm problem, by finding two points on the curve and then connecting them and seeing where a third point on that line ends up on the curve. Uh, that's a long geometric explanation, but the bottom line is that that's how you can create a public key, but no one can take that public key and reverse it and get your private keys and unlock your bitcoins. Unless, of course, there's a weakness in the elliptic curve cartography system. Just to clarify, Andreas, when you're saying public key pair or public key and private key, the public key is your Bitcoin address, correct? And then the private key is like the thing that unlocks the bitcoins from your Bitcoin address. That is correct. The public key actually is hashed twice and creates the Bitcoin address. So yes, that is the public key effectively. And the private key, you don't really see the the private key is essentially uh, encrypted in your wallet and is what you type in your password in order to achieve spending of Bitcoins. That's how you spend Bitcoins by using that private key to sign a transaction. Right. So like the analogy would be, it's almost like an email address where like if somebody has your public key or well, if somebody has your address, which is related to the public key, then they can send bitcoins to you, but they can't send them from that address. Correct. But if they have the private key, they could move bitcoins out of that address. They could spend. And yeah. so the key question here is, are elliptic curves weak? And Again, my conclusion right now is that the particular elliptic curve that Satoshi picked, which is called a Koblitz curve, uh, and in fact, it's known by the uh, moniker SECP256K1. So it's known as the K1 Koblitz curve, uh, 256 bits um, elliptic curve. So, th so that particular curve is one of the curves that was promoted by the National Institutes of Science and Technology, or NIST. And they promoted about a dozen different curves. And so the question now is, did they pick those curves randomly? Did they pick those curves deliberately, knowing that there's a weakness that the rest of the world doesn't know about in specific curves? And there's a big concern now because obviously we've lost trust. We've completely lost trust in anything the NSA says. So does the... NIST or the NSA or the government use those for their own encryption because you would think they probably want to keep some of their stuff encrypted too. So why would they promote vulnerable algorithms for their own use? So yes, the whole point of NIST is that if a curve is approved by NIST and then uh, further recommended by the NSA, it is used by government to protect sensitive, secret and top secret communications. So this is an endorsement to use that encryption. It would take enormous hubris and arrogance to promote a weak encryption scheme uh, under the assumption that you're smarter than everybody else and you're the only one who can figure out that weakness and exploit it. It would take enormous hubris and arrogance to do that. So let's take some bets. Who thinks the NSA is that <laughs> arrogant and would actually do something that stupid? I'll put money behind that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't put it past them. So based on what you've been able to figure out, Andreas, does it seem like either of these standards are compromised? I think that we came very close and we may have possibly dodged a bullet, but the jury is still out. We're still not sure what's happening with the elliptic curves. The possibility of SHA-256 being broken is very low. And given, given the impact on Bitcoin is not really a big concern, because again, you'd have to be able to pull a 51% attack. You can change the proof of work. There's a lot of things you can do. It's much more disconcerting, much more worrying if elliptic curves are broken. But of all of the elliptic curves that were recommended by NIST, the least subject to manipulation are the Koblitz curves because they're not based on random numbers. They're instead based on specific prime numbers that were invented by, I believe his name is Dan Koblitz, the guy who invented elliptic curve cryptography. That curve is less 
suspect. If Satoshi had picked one of the random curves, I would be very worried. Like a lot of businesses are very worried right now because they're using some of the random curves. And now they can't figure out if the random numbers that are used to design those curves are random or if they have been picked specifically because they correspond to weak curves. So now when you say a weak curve, we mean basically that that the NSA or any other real agency out there that is focused into this cybersecurity area has a lot of horsepower from a computational standpoint that they can throw at these things. And so if they can throw a whole bunch of computational power at one curve that they know to be weak, they can essentially map it out. And then if that curve gets adopted, then it becomes much, much easier to compromise anything that has used that curve in its security. Is that right? Because it becomes a known a known part of it. Well, map it out, no, because it's a, it's, it's a very large curve. I mean, mapping it out is not possible. However, th- the idea of a weak curve is basically that the curve itself has some characteristic that can be exploited in order to arrive at a mathematical solution that is less hard than the brute force solution. So if it took you a quadrillion years to do it by brute force, if you can find one that is faster, a shortcut essentially, to doing this in less than brute force, uh, that's a weak curve. Hmm. So I have a question that's related to this. I've heard that because of these revelations about encryption weakness that have come out just recently, SSL is now considered not secure. I think that could potentially affect a lot of people using Bitcoins, like, for instance, web wallets or even, you know, like the online banking and the legacy banking system that they do or any number of logins to different websites. But is that right, Andreas? SSL is not secure against the NSA. I think that's important to understand. And primarily the attacks against the SSL security have not been technological as much as organizational, political and technological at the same time. So steal the keys, force the company to give them to you, blackmail them into giving you a backdoor, et cetera, et cetera. There's a big difference because in this case, we do not believe that SSL was made deliberately weaker. We believe instead that they've used various extra legal techniques to blackmail the certificate authorities into handing over signing keys. And as a result, they can basically spoof any SSL site they want and do man in the middle attacks. The only good news, the silver lining out of that cloud is that if that's the case, that is a capability that is unique to the NSA because of its political clout in the US and therefore not easy to replicate by other. Others. Whereas if they've weakened the underlying security primitives, then that can be replicated by anyone who has mathematicians. So from a certain point of view, it's actually better that they resort to blackmail or, or threats than to actually compromise the standard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because in fact, you know, uh, you know, look, look at this from a practical perspective. Resorting to blackmail is part of, is part of their institutional mandate. You know, uh, if they did it to foreigners, perhaps that might even be acceptable. Weakening the security standards is stupid on so many levels because it violates the basic social compact and the basic trust between the NSA and the American people that the second part of their mission, which is making the American infrastructure more secure, has effectively been compromised by the first part of their mission. So that's the problem. So how could we get better standards for encryption? Like, are there people who are not affiliated with the government who are going to audit each other's work and might be able to put out new encryption technologies for us to use? Yeah, that's a great question, Stephanie. So that's the other silver lining that has come out of this. The entire encryption and security community is pissed off. Very, very very angry, very betrayed, very angry, and very resentful about this. Because what did they expect? <laughs> well, no, what they expected, what they expected was that uh, NSA would follow their mandate and act in good faith, at least vis-a-vis American infrastructure, American technology, and American citizens. That was the social compact. And in fact, the NSA has been working with technology companies since its inception based on that social compact. And they broke it, and they're going to pay the price. Because right now, a big chunk of the IETF, a big chunk of the security community, and a big chunk of the cryptography community has made it their life's goal to rewrite the internet from the bottom up and make it to NSA proof. They pissed off the wrong people. I think you're going to see essentially the internet changing over the next couple of decades. We built the internet as an open, good faith network, and now we're going to have to rebuild it as a dark net of dark nets. Don't mess with the hackers. Don't mess with the hackers. Don't mess with the cryptographers. 
So, Andrea, it's just uh, to wrap this up, uh, you know, it, it, it sounds like right now there are concerns, but it doesn't look like either of the standards that are actually applicable to Bitcoin have been broken or it's very likely that they're broken. There are there are other standards that are much more likely because of the random numbers in the elliptic curve, as we were talking about before. Um, I, I wanted to know, you know, one of the things that people talk about for Bitcoin is the idea that if and when we arrive at a quantum computing reality, then RSA is basically out the window because because you it, it's order of magnitude it's easier than it is now in order to, to compromise that standard. Is there something to that? Is this something that we should be concerned about? Do you well, have any first of all, on? we don't we don't use RSA within Bitcoin. I keep uh, saying Sha- RSA instead of SHA. I don't think SHA would be affected by quantum computing as much as uh, some of the other cryptographic primitives would be. Listen, at the moment, we're already in a quantum computing world. If you believe the technological analysis of the D-Wave system, we already have 256 and even possibly 512 qubit quantum computers. And guess who has those? Of course, the NSA. I'm not worried by quantum computing at all for two reasons. The first one, as I said before, is that if uh, if an attack is is specific to a single adversary and that adversary has other ways of taking Bitcoin down, then that's really not causing a problem. The advantage right now is that the only people who can apply quantum cryptography are those who can buy quantum computers and there aren't that many around. If that became a broader problem and everybody could buy quantum computers, then we can change the encryption algorithms and use those quantum computers to do cryptography as well as decryption. So this is an arms race. If and when quantum computers become widespread, then we will use those to build better cryptography as well as better decryption. More than 300,000 users and counting trust blockchain.info. It's a Bitcoin wallet service and a wealth of Bitcoin information and is completely free to use. With a blockchain.info wallet, you'll get the convenience of a web wallet and the security of a desktop client. Blockchain.info is also a block explorer. You can use it to see Bitcoin transactions in real time, check the balance of any Bitcoin address, and view many handy Bitcoin charts all for free. See what they have to offer today at blockchain.info.